Hello and welcome to this revision podcast on 1800s medicine. 1800s was a time of industrial revolution in Britain, a time of huge technological and scientific development, but also of really cramped towns where disease could spread easily. People had migrated to towns to get factory work, and so the conditions were crowded, where disease could pass from one person to the other quite easily. So industry had also increased massively. This urbanisation in itself caused filthy diseases like cholera and typhus, dysentery and smallpox. Factories themselves also caused lung diseases and, for example, fossy jaw. There's also the fact that this is a period where the British Empire was expanding and travel to the countries or colonies of the empire brought back new diseases, for example, yellow fever. The houses were back-to-back houses. There were no sewers, there were shared toilets, there were cesspits where people just dumped their poo, and these seeped into the water supply, which caused the disease. So this meant that it was poor people that mainly suffered, uh, whereas rich people lived out in big houses further out in the countryside. So in some areas, life expectancy was really low. For example, in Liverpool, it was 15 years on average that you would live to. Overall, it was about 30 that you would live to, although if you were were rich, you'd live a lot longer. All in all, health had got worse than in medieval times. So much for progress, eh? However, like I said, there was great wealth due to the British Empire and trade, which meant that rich people could do medical research, or, or they could spend this money on public health. There was also social change over the 1800s, and advances in democracy which helped change people's attitudes to public health. War continued and this developed new injuries, but also the need for new surgery and medical techniques. At this time people thought miasma caused disease. A lot of people thought miasma caused disease, not everyone. And so when something smelt they believed that caused the disease. So what they did is they flooded the drainage into the river and now you just got poo in the river. They burnt tar barrels to stop the smell, but obviously that didn't work. Pollution was also a problem from these factories that were mainly run on steam or later on on oil. The worst disease at this point was cholera, which killed 50,000 people in one of the great outbreaks in 1831. And it killed them with lightning speed. There was no cure. And outbreaks like these led to the government sending Edwin Chadwick to find out what the causes of cholera was. So he was an example of a social reformer and Edwin Chadwick wrote the first public health act in 1848 and this was really a result of his 1842 report which made rich people aware that it wasn't the poor's fault that they were in bad conditions. The report said that people needed clean water, sewers and drains and that more people died of disease at this point than died from wars. It argued that the main reason for poverty was disease and by curing that people as a whole would get richer and the country would get richer. Money would be saved by everyone not having to pay for the, uh, the poor rates, a type of tax. The cholera epidemic of 1848 helped get this Public Health Act of 1848 passed. 10,000 copies of um, Chadwick's report were given out free to journalists, writers and politicians. Chadwick himself wrongly thought that disease was caused by miasma, but it didn't really matter because he was cleaning up the streets and that would still help. And people now realise that the poor people are not to blame for their own conditions and that government would have to do something about it. So the 1848 Public Health Act was published and made into a law. But it was flawed because it only targeted areas that had high death rates. It said that local authorities had to clean up the streets and it set up a national board of health. Drainage, sewers, rubbish collections, water supplies, public laboratories uh, all had to be provided and that local authorities had to appoint medical officers. It wasn't compulsory unless there were really high death rates. And by 1853, only 103 towns had set up a board of health. By 1853, the vaccination of smallpox was made compulsory. But as for cholera, there was another epidemic in 1854. And it shows that the first public health act of 1848 was not working. John Snow realised that cholera was spread by water, not by miasma. And he proved it by marking on maps where the deaths had been. He realised and stated that all the people who died drank the same water. Unfortunately, few people believed him at that time in 1854. 
because it was seven years before germ theory was proven. In 1858, there was um, a heat wave which caused a great stink, made the uh, River Thames really smell. So Joseph Bazalgette, an engineer, was given three million pounds, which was a hell of a lot of money in those days, and he was employed to build a sewer network in central London to get rid of the great stink. They thought that the poo would be taken far away from the city, and it does actually work as it gets rid of the germs, not the smell as they thought. And it was finished by 1866, and cholera never returned. By 1875, germ theory had been proven. The next public health act in that year was a little bit stronger, enforcing provision of sewers and clean water, as well as rubbish and slum clearance. It said that pavements must be lit, paved and cleaned, and that the uh, local authorities could get taxes from the people to do this. As well as the sewers, other technology also helped. Joseph Lister's father had invented a multi-lens microscope, and x-rays were invented right at the end of the century. Also, the hypodermic syringe and the stethoscope to listen to a patient's chest were developed in the 1800s. Public health also improved with vaccination. The biggest killer disease before 1800 was smallpox. It was highly infectious and could be caught by coughing, sneezing or just touching somebody with it. It left you with massive possible blisters that caused horrendous scars and it also, more importantly, killed people in huge numbers. There was no cure. Lady Wharton Montague had brought back a technique used for many years in China and also Turkey, which is where she picked it up. Doctors had made thousands from her inoculation technique, which gave them a less dangerous form of disease to stop them getting the worst kind. However, only, only the rich could afford it and sometimes killed them too. In 1796, Jenna stabbed an eight-year-old kid with cowpox to stop him from getting smallpox, and luckily for both of them, it works. He repeated the experiment 23 times, even on his own child. The Royal Society rejected it, but he published the idea himself, and it caught on. For example, Napoleon forced his army to have it. Eventually, the government gave him money to open a clinic, and by 1853, it was compulsory. Some people opposed it, some people thought it was dangerous, some just didn't like new or bizarre ideas. Jenner himself wasn't a fashionable London doctor, and he couldn't even explain how his ideas worked, which didn't help. Also, many doctors opposed it because it deprived them of the cash that they were making beforehand with Lady Mary Wortley Montague's inoculation techniques. To be honest, Jenner wasn't the first guy to figure out cowpox prevented smallpox, but, importantly, he was the first one to test it again and again, scientifically, and also the first one to publish his findings. Hospitals in 1800 were mainly for the poor, and they were very dangerous places to be. Nurses were untrained and even sometimes paid in gin, and so they were often drunk, and they sometimes even slept in the patients' beds. It all changed. Florence Nightingale was a big driver of this change. She'd been to the Crimea in the Crimean War, and she'd improved the death rate there in the hospital in Scutari by 46%. She then came back and set up a, a nursing school. She wrote an 800-page report saying it needed, uh, needed to be improved, and she wrote a book on nursing. Obviously, nursing improved. There was also improvement in hospital hygiene that was down to her. She raised £40,000 to set up Britain's first nurse training school at St Thomas's Hospital in London, and she even wrote a report on new ideas about the design of hospitals. She wanted them to be spacious and well ventilated, and even though she still believed in miasma, those things were good for a hospital. Her ideas spread all over the globe, and people came to see her from different countries to ask her advice. Hospitals also improved with Joseph Lister's discovery of carbolic acids that cleans wounds, and antiseptics improve public health as well. There's a build-up of knowledge from scientific methods that are carried on and improved from Renaissance times. There's a general scientific atmosphere of the time of the 1800s, which led to the improvements in industry, but also had a knock-on effect of the improvements in medicine. Henry Gray wrote something called Gray's Anatomy, which had a thousand pictures in it, and it was very popular, became a bestseller, and it's still even published today. The biggest date, though, has to be 1861, which is germ theory. Germs had already been found. Anthony van Leeuwenhoek discovered them using a microscope in 1677 and called them animacules. Most people believed that miasma, or this infectious mist rising from decaying matter, which is why people carried flowers at the time of the plague, they believed this miasma caused disease. When people knew that germs were around, they realised that the two were linked, but they got the wrong end of the stick. They thought that the germs were caused by the disease, that these germs spontaneously generated as if by magic when the disease was around, rather than the correct way around, which is that the germs actually cause the disease. But Pasteur proved it with his two long neck flasks, and Pasteur was determined to fight disease by the death of his two daughters. He initially proved that particles in the air made liquid 
that he was being paid to investigate wine and, and beer, he proved it made it go cloudy. And this disproved spontaneous generation. It proved that outside agents caused alcohol to go off. But Pasteur was a scientist and not a doctor, so he didn't apply it to medicine. Others started to think about this in terms of medicine. For example, Robert Koch. But he also stimulated Lister and Pasteur himself to think about germs in terms of medicine. Koch and Pasteur were determined to beat each other for the glory of their two countries. Charles Chamberland, another French guy, discovered viruses in 1884. And viruses are another tiny organism, even smaller than bacteria, that also cause disease. Robert Koch was famous for staining bacteria so that he could isolate them and study them and prove that they were the things that were causing disease. He found a way first of staining anthrax germs and he proved that this germ led to disease by injecting mice with it. He did the same thing with tuberculosis and cholera. Doctors and scientists then realised that if they could find a chemical that just stained the germs and not the cells of the body, then they also could find a chemical that might kill the germs and not damage the body. And this would be called the magic bullet. Paul Ehrlich and Hatter discovered the first one, Salvasan, 606 in 1910. Spurred on by Robert Koch, Chamberlain and Pasteur discovered a chicken cholera vaccine and they understand how it works that a weakened form of the disease can actually stimulate the antibodies to protect you from the real form of the disease. And this then leads to other vaccines for other diseases, anthrax, tuberculosis and diphtheria, although most didn't work at this point. Their respective governments, France and Germany, Pasteur and Koch, their countries were enemies, so the governments gave them lots of money to prove that their country was the best and compete with each other. The training of doctors improved due to germ theory. There are now more medical schools, more dissection, more knowledge due to surgery. Doctors now observe symptoms and they thought for themselves. They still relied on patients' payments for, for visits and for medicines, and the government played no part in the training. All the universities were reliant on using books to teach, and there was only very little practical training. But doctors also had private tutors to help them learn. They didn't have that much equipment, maybe a stethoscope and a few other rudimentary technologies. However, women could become doctors from 1870 onwards. Elizabeth Blackwell, Elizabeth Gale Anderson and Sophia Jex Blake all pioneered women doctors. However, they were the exceptions and men did everything they could to stop women training. All three of these had to study abroad to qualify as a doctor. By 1876, the government passed an act saying women could not be refused medical training or qualifications. Communications were improved. For example, the train had been invented and telegraph. And you could send messages in wartime about injuries, for example. You could spread ideas quicker. The Lancet was a medical journal that was first published in 1823. And it's where doctors and scientists could share and publish their ideas on medicine and surgery. So by 1900, doctors were very highly respected. <laughs>